Welcome everyone. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's conversation and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we would love to connect. So on Facebook, like the page campaign for GLR, and on Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Okay, once again, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sierra Sanchez, and I'll be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself. So please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city or state and your organization. Be sure when responding, select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen only mode, but we encourage your engagement by posting questions in the Q&A box. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed on Friday to all who registered. And all resources that you see shared as links in the chat will be compiled and shared in the same follow up email to all webinar registrants. Lastly, we'll be posting a brief on screen evaluation during closing and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Finally, before we begin, I would just like to call your attention to our upcoming GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. Next week, we have an exciting double header, starting with a session at 1230. The Hurt Could Last a Lifetime, Data Growing Gaps and Rays of Hope, followed by a session co-sponsored by the Children's Funding Project, How States and Communities Are Maximizing American Rescue Plan Funding for Kids in 2022 and Beyond. Uh, to round off the month of January, we'll have families on shaky ground, uncloaking and addressing the realities of persistent instability. Registration and information for these sessions, including the 3 p.m. on January 18th, which will be hosted on a different platform, will be posted in the chat box now. Joining you now is Becky Miles Polka, Senior Consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Better click those. Uh little things that get me on video and get me off of mute. So thank you, Sierra. I'm delighted to be here today to open up this webinar. And uh, we have a stellar panel for you today. Uh, you know, when the pandemic began, um, it really exposed the deep inequities in digital technology in our communities. Many families had no access to internet. And if they did, they were perhaps using just one device that might be a cell phone. Um, to serve multiple children. And even when districts and communities stepped up with solutions, they were band-aids at best. School districts had insufficient technology in house and many teachers had limited technology at home to use or outdated technology. And make no mistake, we have made significant gains and there has been much to be celebrated, but there is much work to be done. Today, we're going to hear from some individuals who are at the forefront of solving the technology divide, as well as from practitioners who are on the ground who have made remarkable gains in their communities. I have had the good fortune over the past few weeks as we have prepared this webinar to learn so much. And I know you are going to learn so much today. Um, I'm so excited for you to hear from this panel, so I don't want to delay any longer. Um, it is my pleasure now to introduce our moderator for today, Jean-Claude Brizard. Jean-Claude is the president and CEO of Digital Promise. Digital Promise is a global nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on accelerating innovation in education. He is a former senior advisor and deputy director at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he focused on pre-K to 16 education. He also led several strategies supporting Washington State's education system. 
He is a former chief executive of the Chicago Public Schools and prior to his appointment in Chicago, he was superintendent of schools for the Rochester, New York School District. Mr. Brizard's experience also includes a 21 year career as an educator and administrator with the New York City Department of Education. He served as regional superintendent supervising more than 100 schools in the borough of Brooklyn and also served at this, as the system's executive director for its 400 secondary schools. He is a fellow of the Broad Center, a fellow of the Pahara Aspen Institute, and a member of the Aspen Institute Global Leadership Network. Please join me in welcoming Jean-Claude. Becky, uh, thank you so, so very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and I'm honored to welcome today's panel of leaders in this uh, really amazing work. Uh, we have, I think, an amazing session planned for all of you. Um, and uh, it's also great to see colleagues from across the country in, in, in the chat. Uh, we're gonna focus on policy. We're gonna focus on practice around this topic. And of course, we're gonna focus on exemplars and how we look at this. Um, so let me first start by introducing our amazing panel. I'll start with uh, Michael Calabrese. Uh, Michael uh, directs the Wireless Futures Project at New America's Open Technology Institute, a nonprofit think tank based in Washington, DC. He develops and advocates policies to promote ubiquitous, fast and affordable wireless broadband connectivity including the reallocation of uh, more prime spectrum to facilitate unlicensed access, next generation Wi-Fi, dynamic spectrum sharing and broadband competition. That sounds really amazing, Michael. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Nathan L. Fisher. Uh, Dr. Fisher or Nate, Nathan um, he goes by many names he told us. The superintendent of Roselle Public School District has served the Roselle community as an educator and administrator for over 30 years. Prior to his role as superintendent, Dr. Fisher previously served as the founding principal of the Borough's Kindergarten Success Academy, vice principal and principal of Abraham Clark High School, and principal of Leonard V. Moore Middle School. He started his career at RPS as a substitute teacher back in 1990. And we have Dr. Christine Gilmore. Um, Christine has led the DC Everest area school district since 2003 as superintendent. Uh, DC Everest is known as an innovative, student-centered, high-achieving, and digitally powered school district throughout the state and nation. Dr. Gilmore is a proven educational leader with experience bringing people together to achieve a shared vision around success for all learners. In 2012, she was named Wisconsin Superintendent of the Year. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we have uh, Chris Rush. Again, I've known Chris a long time. Chris serves as the senior advisor to the Secretary of for Innovation and Director of Educational Technology at the US Department of Education. He also is co-founder of New Classroom Innovating, Innovation Partners, a nonprofit focused on new instructional models, including the School of One personalized learning program, named one of Time Magazine's top 50 inventions of the year. Last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. DeAndre J. Weaver. Uh, DeAndre serves, we call him Dre, uh, serves as Chief Digital Equity Officer at Digital Province Global. Uh, as Chief Digital Equity Officer, uh, DeAndre, uh, Dre oversees the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools Program, part of Verizon's flagship education initiative with a national network of more than 500 Title I schools. Additionally, Dre will use lessons learned from the Verizon Innovation uh, Program and other digital promise initiatives to develop new state and district level opportunities for the organization that will further the goal of improving digital equity. Uh, as a former public school teacher, principal, school leader, and superintendent, uh, Dre cares deeply about helping students realize their dreams. His leadership is centered around equity and access learner-centered approaches, advancing digital equity in organizational health. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, perhaps do a little bit of um, table setting around this particular uh, um, uh, work. Go next slide, please. One, this is a continuing dialogue. Back in June, we had a conversation called Big Bets in thinking about ways in which we need to solve this problem. In it, we call for once and for all, to close the digital learning gap or the digital gap in America as a foundation for the work that we need to do in our schools and in our classrooms. Next, please. One, 
uh, I think this is not a surprise to many of us uh, here, is that we are facing the largest global education crisis in the last century. Um, we have a lot of places where we know children are coming back to school. Uh, we know we have issues around the digital divide, especially with kids who are uh, historically marginalized. We have huge issues of mental health and social emotional issues in our schools because of isolation uh, and, and socialization. Um, but really an important thing to keep thinking about is the fact that, um, again, this is, was pushed by the World Bank, um, that we tend to, young people today tend to lose 10 trillion US dollars in foreign earnings if we don't find a way to really address the issues of what we call the digital um, learning gap. Next slide, please. But as you all know, the pandemic has only highlighted issues that's been long standing. Um, this is from Rebecca Winthrop's uh, uh, really famous book, Leapfrogging Inequality. She's of the Brookings Institution. Um, she really lays out uh, the case that uh, by 2030, we may have nearly a billion children uh, who will reach adulthood without basic secondary level. This is again, a global figure. And that these figures don't even account for the kinds of work we need to do. Uh, when we think about, frankly, the kind of 21st century, well, um, the kinds of skills we need today for young people to really um, get access to uh, the new world's economy, to have agency in their life, um, and frankly, to have the kind of uh, economic stability goal that we are looking for. Next, please. This slide really, for me, represents um, some of the work, well, the work that we need to do in our schools. Uh, this is a, a, a progression of data looking at the same cohort of young people from early learning through post-secondary in one state in the US. Um, and we really believe that this is, um, uh, uh, this could be a sort of a mirror to what exists across all 50 states in the country. So if you were to look from the left to the right, you take a, the young people who are proficient in say elementary school reading, and you follow them across the same, the same cohort of young people across time to post-secondary um, completion, you can see that we have a massive issue. One, the largest sector of the American public has some college. And the fact that only about 25% of these young people actually end up earning a two or four year degree. Um, I don't have the slide here, but if you were to lay, overlay this on, with an equity lens, it would be really terrifying because the numbers drop from 25 to frankly 12, 13% of young people coming from the left to the right finishing post-secondary. So the argument here is that we need to really take a look at the attrition within the system, the attrition across system, what we need to do in our school districts, in our schools, in our classrooms, really change this particular narrative and paradigm. And as we'll discuss, we think that technology is a foundation um, to bring the kinds of innovations that we think is really great so necessary to look at both the academic and non-academic development of our young people to change this particular narrative. Next slide, please. So we push again that we need to close the digital learning gap. And for us, it's looking at three different ways of doing that. Gaps in access, gaps in participation, and of course, gaps in powerful use. You'll see, as we talk about some of the exemplars, that all three of these are key and important. And the last one here on powerful use require the kind of coaching and support that teachers and principals need and really understanding really how uh, to leverage technology in the classroom. And you'll hear from our superintendents who have been doing this work really uh, powerfully um, for a number of years. Next slide, please. So last but not, um, almost not least, why we need to close the digital learning gap. Notice we talk about the digital learning gap, not just the digital gap, is that when you look at again, the future of work or the present of work, when you look at the skills young people need to succeed in today's post-secondary environment, um, when you look at the kinds of non-academic development that are necessary, um, you begin to really understand the work that we'll need to do collectively to again, change that narrative you saw earlier. And we'll talk sort of deliberately about what we mean by digital learning gap, both in terms of closing access to devices, broadband, and frankly, what it means for the work in our classrooms and our schools. Next slide, please. Great, we're gonna move now into the panel conversation. So I'll ask my panelists to please come off, um, to come on camera um, and uh, feel free to come off mute whenever is necessary. 
Uh, thanks for being here again. Um, and to all of you in the audience, uh, this is really a treat. Uh, there's a powerful, this is a powerful group of people here. Uh, I encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A throughout the conversation, and we'll leave ample time at the end um, to, um, to address your questions. I know Becky will be monitoring the Q&A and making sure that we try to see as honest as possible and answer as many questions as, as possible. So I, I'm one as, as a practitioner, I love to start with practitioners, folks who are in the trenches. And I know these are difficult times for school districts. So I really am grateful uh, for you, Dr. Gilmore and, and Dr. Fisher for being for being here today. And forgive me if I, if, I, if I pivot between Christine and Nathan and Dr. Fisher, Dr. Gilmore, so forgive me that. So, so you've been in the middle of the arena these last two years since the pandemic uh, actually happened. What have you seen related to issues of digital equity, how you've approached the work, and what areas do you think we still need to truly address? Certainly, well, thanks everyone for having us here today. Um, I, I really believe, at least in our community, and, and I talk to superintendents across the United States, we've all seen the same types of issues. And that's really, it starts with connectivity. Um, we can talk about digital equity, about giving kids devices or access to wonderful materials or a curriculum online, but if they don't have access at home, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because then it's basically a device that doesn't do much for them. So for us, it was really, we were lucky. We had all of our students were one-to-one, -one, all of our staffs had, were one-to-one -one with devices, but we still had gaps. Um, where, you know, we, we thought we could give hotspots, but there's some places where the hotspot doesn't work, doesn't connect, or it only connects a certain amount of time. Um, we really, really had to regroup and think about what once was considered as adequate bandwidth is no longer the case, right? When mom and dad were working from home and all the siblings and trying to download, um, it just didn't work. And so we really had to be um, thoughtful about how we re were reaching out to our community partners, opening up our schools as best we could, our parking lots, um, providing facilities uh, so that people could come in. Because I think uh, what we learned during the pandemic is not only is learning and our schools important to our students, they're part of the economic infrastructure of our communities. And so I think it's really essential that, um, you know, right now schools seem to be the place people are fighting a lot of the political uh, divisions they have, which is ironic because it's one of the most important places that we should really be focusing our energies on our students. I mean, if we're gonna come out on the other side of this pandemic, it's, it's the future of our high school students right now that are gonna carry us through it. So I've tried to put, as much energy as I have into our kids versus fighting the conversations on the outside. I'm not always able to do that because that's not what happens at board meetings right now. Um, but I think if we can continue to focus and get people to focus back around what's best for our students, then we can change the conversation. Well said, uh, Christine. Nathan, Dr. Fisher. Yes, and, and I have to concur with uh, Dr. Gilmore on uh, several points. And, and through this pandemic period, one of the, the greatest things that we were impacted as, as school leaders were we had to strongly pivot during the pandemic. And, you know, and we realized throughout this pandemic period, uh, early on, even talking to my colleagues across the country, uh, there was a variant uh, understanding as to what digital learning was all about. So we had to have a, a very unified definition, you know, whether we were speaking from a, a place of digital inclusion, uh, digital equity, or just the digital divide. Those were spaces that that really driv driven uh, our, our, our focus for the, the entire school district. So we really had to look at a number of areas before we could even uh, get started. But I, was, I would say immediately the challenge was uh, the impact of understanding the needs of our families. Uh, if I can uh, clearly say, you know, we make the assumption as educators, we made the assumption that uh, that every home was adequately uh, equipped to access the, 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 the broadband services. And that's not always the case. So we had to reevaluate that using a variety of, of measures to determine what those family needs were during this pandemic period. And that was quite difficult because again, 
you know, we had to pivot very quickly in order to provide some stability in our, our learning space. So one of the things we, we tried to focus on uh, was trying to identify family needs of whether it was uh, devices where we had to determine the uh, uh, broadband access. We, we did find that families weren't as uh, willing to share information if they didn't have access and what that access may look like. You know, there were some families who made the assumption that they had access based on portable uh, devices, uh, such as a cell phone. That, well, that wasn't adequate enough for uh, to service our students. So we had to use that as a, 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 a a, a point of beginning to really determine where we needed to put our priorities. So I, I tell you, we because we weren't a, a, a one to one district, we had to very quickly become a one to one district and ensure that every student had a device. And that was just part of the equation, but ensuring that they could connect to this to the, the to the internet. Uh, you know, for some students, the internet was closed because they didn't have access at home. So they were so used. We had done a phenomenal job providing access within our school facilities. But unfortunately, we, we, we were exposed during this pandemic period as to we weren't making that full connectivity. So uh, that was one of the most challenging pieces. The second piece of that is we, we, we put a, a significant burden on our educators to really shift their practice from traditional to, to very uh, 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 di uh, di digital ed educators. So that was a major shift at which we had to provide a host of, of support for our, our, our teachers in the district. So we had to you know, really take a, a, a deep dive in regards to ensuring that schoolhouse resources became digital resources, and then ensuring that all students had the ability to access these resources. How, how can we provide academic support to our students in a virtual space? So those types of things were the things that we had to prioritize. Uh, how do we provide additional services? You know, schools are, a, 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 a place of uh, providing social services for students, so students and families. So we had to find ways to make that into a digital space to ensure that we were reaching all our families. And it, it became an ongoing challenge and, it, and it's evolving because as we put things in place, there's always something new in this digital digital space that challenges us further. But again, it, the, uh, it, it is an ongoing challenge, but I will say that uh, similar to Dr. Gilmore's uh, space, we wanted to make sure that we found creative and innovative approaches, you know, ensuring that our students had access, multi levels of access, whether it was providing them with uh, uh, LTE, LTE enabled devices, whether it was the hotspots, whether it was the exterior uh, missed devices where we have drive, you know, drive up internet access, or simply deploying our district vehicles and making them uh, a hotspot vehicles that we pushed out into the, the, the community. So those types of things required that we, we did at a moment's notice, but we were very fortunate that we were, were capable, we had the financial resources to support us in that space. But ultimately, the challenge from a leadership space really put us in a, a position where uh, this is ongoing. And we've seen this as something that uh, it's not going away. It's not going away. We had to re-pivot our, our efforts most recently. So we wanted to ensure that we are looking for opportunities that we, we service all students in the entire community uh, to eliminate the frustration that our families and our students are experiencing. You know, as, as expected, you both have said a ton. Uh, Dr. Gilmore, you're about to say something. Please go ahead. No, I was just going to respond to the some of the questions I see in the chat, because I think sometimes people assume that schools that are known to be um, digitally responsive expect kids to be on, on their devices all day. And that is very far from the truth if you really care about quality learning. I think if we've learned anything through the pandemic that our devices are a tool, um, they are another tool in the teacher's toolbox with kids. They're a way for kids to create, uh, connect. But we also spent, a, I, I feel like I could be in the next um, program you talked about is how do you spend your ESSER monies? We spent almost all of our initial ESSER money to create really small cohorts in our K one, two and three grades so we could get kids back to school in person. Um, and I'm happy to say because of that, and, and that would be also with technology, our literacy scores um, at K-1, 2, and 3 were the highest they've been uh, since I've worked here, and that's 19 years as superintendent. So we know we're making a difference. We didn't actually, we saw a gap for more of our secondary students than we saw for our early elementary students. So, you know, I think the pandemic has really taught us to lean into what we've learned. I think we've always done some stuff that 
really wasn't that useful. That wasn't that great for kids. And so we've really tried to focus, um, right, and identify what are the, the most important needs of our kids. It starts with relationships, right? Nobody says is the most important need for a kid is a device. It's a relationship with an adult who cares about them. And then how do we build that learning around that? Um, and I think it goes back to that. I, I brought up this question when we were talking yesterday. What does it mean to be a teacher now? I can tell you it's not the same when, when I was a teacher. The expectations for teachers now, I think one of the things we have to look at is what are our, um, what are we doing right now for our teachers? And then what are we doing for future teachers? Because I'm not sure they are all trained or have the background to do all of the things we expect and ask for. Yes, and, and that's why it's so important that we offer a continual professional development opportunities for our teachers, because it is something uh, that we've put a heavy burden on, on teachers, particularly who've been teaching from a, a, a traditional uh, platform to more in a digital space. So it, it's important that we continue to prioritize that. And uh, just to kind of segue into another piece of that is that I oft, often realize that as we are supporting our teachers, it is crucial that we continue to use these platforms and these opportunities to support our students academically. So we've taken in our district to, uh, an opportunity to provide uh, ongoing uh, academic support for our students, ongoing uh, 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 counseling services. Those are the types of things that are essential to be successful in this digital space. And even utilizing this digital platform, we've increased our ability to communicate with our families and provide uh, additional uh, family engagement opportunities throughout this pandemic period. That was probably more essential and greater participation because it was much more of a flexible type of scheduling that many of our families were impacted by on a traditional a traditional school year. So I think all those things wrap into this whole concept of how do we meet people where they are? So we have to use these platforms, but use it for the advantages because as our society continues to evolve, we're in a space where we're gonna to have to continually adapt our resources to meet the needs of our community. So I, I just have to say that it was, uh, it, it continues to be a, a, a priority for my district. It's a priority for my leadership who understands that uh, by any means necessary, we'll reach every kid. You know, it's about every every student every day. So that that effort has to be at the forefront of every decision that we're making. So it's very intentional. Our resources are very uh, uh, specific and uh, they're targeted to the needs of our kids in this particular environment. So again, Dr. Gilmore is hitting it on the head with all those those key points. You know, these school communities are so reliant on the, on, on what we do as a school community. The community that necessarily have a clear insight to the in the value of what we've done daily. So I think that as we continue to use what we've learned from this pandemic period with technology and digital uh, tools, we can do even greater work in the educational space. I mean, as, as expected, you guys, you two are, are hitting a lot. And I'm going to come back to you a bit later on uh, for some of the things you've outlined, uh, including um, uh, Dr. Gilmore, the fact that you are in, in the rural part of Wisconsin and the kinds of challenges that may present around broadband access. You've also been at this a long time, so really would love to go down the road. I'll come back to you in a bit about how prepared you were for March of 2020 when like, it all hell broke loose around, around schools. I was around the first school district that closed in the nation. I was in Washington State, uh, went in public schools, the first to close in the nation, and watching that whole to your point, Dr. Fisher, community impact, not just a school, but a whole community impact is an important way to look at this. Chris, if I may bring, bring your voice into the conversation, um, you've been hosting a series of webinars at the USDOE, and I've had uh, the pleasure of being a part of some of those. Um, so it's the title, Planning for Changing Learning Scenarios, Navigating the Road Ahead, a small topic, right? Uh, what have you been hearing from these practitioners well, that's going to be a few, few big takeaways from the conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, the webinar series has been fascinating. Thank you so much for, um, for your contributions as well. I've uh, enjoyed just even hearing more now from Dr. Gilmore and Dr. Uh, Fisher on some of these thoughts. But yeah, we got to hear from a number of other superintendents and practitioners out there. And there were some big takeaways that I had. And I'm curious whether or not uh, some of the other panelists here would agree. But... The, I'm going to sort of share three right now. Um, 
And the first one was, yes, it's true. It was true 10 years ago. And it's true now that there are a number of student need, needs that are going unmet. But what's different right now is that the circumstances around school and learning are rapidly shifting and therefore it's forcing action. Before, you know, a decade ago or even just two, two years ago before the pandemic, you could actually choose to do, you could do nothing. You could wait, you could try to figure out what the way to do it through policy was or how to get the funding. And now schools, teachers, parents, students have no choice but to act. And sometimes that goes well, <laughs> and sometimes it's not. It, it, it can be a mixed bag in that sense. And whenever they look to act, there's a choice to be made. You can look from sort of existing tools and practices that are out there, but for a number of the circumstances that, are, that everyone's facing right now, there's, there's not that much best practice to be, to be found. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of invention happening. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of innovative activities happening. And everyone's not always set up to do that well. So when you take the great experiment of remote learning, it often gets demonized out there. But there are plenty of places and plenty of teachers that did it well. There are plenty of communities that feel like there were strengths to be had from it and they don't wanna lose all of those benefits. And there's frustration that in many ways that's being demonized out there because they wanna pull the things that are working, the things that seem additive and be able to incorporate them into what's going on. So that brings me to my second point, our big takeaway, which has been around how, how schools and districts and, and parents and families are really sort of acting ahead. They're, they're out in front of policy and regulation. They feel like that's holding them back. But at the same time, it's been going on so long now that for the first time in a long time, it feels like there's cover to actually just try new things and ask for forgiveness if that doesn't work. And I'm hearing more and more that in this, this pushback to, to normal, whatever that's gonna end up being, that there's a desire to preserve the ability to actually try new things so that you can do whatever you think is most helpful to service your communities, your students, your teachers. And how do we preserve a bit of that? And I, I think that's an interesting whole other topic to dive into if people are interested. And I'll throw out my third one, which is just overall that digital learning really is a mixed bag. And the mixed bag is it doesn't mean it's a crapshoot <laughs> when you try to put it in. It means there are pros and cons. The digital interface allows us to involve parents more. They can see what's happening. At the same time, I think, you know, to Dr. Gilmore's point, it's not just about the content and whether or not you are learning skill by skill, but you need to be able to make real connections. And then for some students, uh, the, the digital, the virtual, some circumstances allows for more connections. For others, fewer. Maybe the answer doesn't have to be binary and that it needs to be more nuanced to different communities, to different students, to different circumstances. And that we really need to figure out how, it can, how we can leverage those things to enhance in-school learning as well as extend the, the school day with remote learning. And how do we actually shift things to embrace the idea that it's not this binary black and white uh, re reality, but instead we need to figure out how to incorporate the, the good of that and, and put aside our fears that everyone will just use it for the worst case scenario and use it in, the, in, the, in a bad way. So th those have been some headlines. I, I saw some nodding, but I really am curious whether or not the, uh, you know, the other panelists would agree or tell me where I totally have it wrong because I, I wanna hear it because I'm trying to figure out how to support these, these things up here. I had a follow-up, Chris, I'm gonna, but I want to relate that I love that push. So anyone else who wants to jump in and react to Chris's push, please, please go ahead. Chris, I appreciate you. I mean, you said something in a way that I don't know if, if everyone got, and it was around this idea of demonizing, you know, what folks are considering remote learning. And from my perspective as a former superintendent and someone that is really passionate about, you know, closing this digital learning gap, um, you know, we've demonized an approach because we were not prepared to utilize the approach in the way that we needed to. And now there's this massive um, push to go back to a normal that wasn't being, um, six, it wasn't in, in, including um, all of the kids in our you know, country that needs to be in, included. And I'm wondering, will this moment in time be an opportunity for us to finally embrace 
um, the traditional model has not been successful for all of our kids. And we can utilize different approaches to create very powerful learning experiences for kids um, in our schools, very similar to the ones that the two superintendents on our call are creating for their kids today. So that really, really resonated with me. There are a number of school districts that I'm hearing uh, are just wanting to go back to what was comfortable, but really wasn't beneficial for children. And, and we have to guard against that. If I just add that I, I totally agree. Um, one of the things that I think, so I live in the middle of Wisconsin, small district, 6,000 students. I, I have always believed we can offer kids anything here that anybody in the entire United States can with digital equity. And I, I think too many people have been afraid to push and maybe because I've been here a long time as I was able to get our, um, businesses behind us to recognize where their pipeline and if we don't do well, they don't do well. So they have supported us on this journey. But I think because of the pandemic, so many more people are trying different things. Teachers, you know, are able to reach out and uh, try some, some other things. We are really involved in the redefining ready work around um, what we think a portrait of a graduate looks like. And I think pandemic has taught us that those are the right things, not just a test score, right? We need people who can think differently and try new things and fail, but then fail forward. And so I, I think it's one of the best times to be an educator, exhausting, but one of the best times. And our kids, they need us to be excited about it. It's their one chance, right? Dr. Fisher, would you concur and how are you yep. perhaps incentivizing your folks to take risks and get ahead of the policy and regulations as Chris actually mentioned? You know, by nature of uh, the profession, you know, uh, I'm just a risk taker, you know, on a regular. And it's important <laughs> to know that, you know, you have to move the needle when it comes to uh, addressing this digital, you know, digital access of all. And I, I just, I really focus on the fact that you know, we're trying to create skill sets that prepare our students for career pathways and soft skills are one thing, but, you know, having a digital digital citizen is a whole nother piece to really make a student more employable or just be successful in life in general. So these things are so essential. There's, it's not a case of, you know, this is one of those skills that it, it was it was on the peripheral in the traditional classroom, but now it's so embedded in the practice it is prioritized in terms of ensuring that kids can use these communication devices for a host of, of collaborations and, and, and sorts of, uh, of, of tools. So there are great things that have come out of this experience. And surely going back to the old is, is not even a, a you know, I, you know, if I can have all my meetings via via Zoom, I'm, I'll be satisfied. I can I can meet from home. So those collaboration tools, uh, being able to interact with peers using digital digital uh, resources, you know, we've exposed kids to a very very practical approach for using technology. We've shown them there's so many applications to this, you know. So we have to look at it from from that lens as opposed to saying let's go back to the old. I mean, kids, you know. We've been able to connect our digital resources in a way with our students that they're actually accessing. And from an administrative lens, I have the ability to track data that's related to users. You know, that's a whole other conversation from this seat that I'm able to uh, uh, connect with. So I think that's more important to really realize how are we using these resources? How are we showing students that these skills are applicable to the real life? Uh, it's, it's part of developing their whole civic responsibility as future, you know, as citizens of this country. So again, it's, I, I concur with my colleagues because again, the thoughts of, and the concepts and the visual and the the forward thinking is where we should be. We should be in that space because that's where we're going. Uh, I, I want to come back to to this, uh, Chris. Why don't you go ahead and say what you want to say before I move on? Yeah, I just had one. So, so given that there is some concurrence in this, and that uh, you know, it's always nice to have that type of thing affirmed and to know that there's someone else like-minded. If, if there was one thing um, that could be done besides money, just for a second, uh, <laughs> you know, from, from, a, from, a, from a federal level or from a national level, that would just really help you out. Um, uh, given, given your agreement with those sort of three things I was saying, what would it be? 
And, and, and I invite people in the chat also, if, there, if there's one thing on the tip of your tongue, you know, just throw it in there because I'm going to take it. I'm going to shamelessly take any opportunity I have to really hear what is the thing that would be most helpful um, for all of you. I, I think it's testing. I think it it's ridiculous that we asked our kids to take an ACT that the universities didn't even ask for this year um, and tell them that they should take it seriously and that we spent a bunch of time on that when we had such a small amount of time with our kids to start with. Um, I also think we should have a campaign across the United States about empowering and celebrating teachers. The work people have done is, should be celebrated, not questioned. I mean, people have spun on their head trying to keep families engaged virtually um, when it was a, a really complicated time. And I just think um, we should value people who take care of our most press precious resources, a, com a country, which is our children. And, and that starts at the top. Chris, uh, along those same lines, uh, you know, and I know this is not possible, but I'll tell a brief story. I had a conversation with the teacher during the height of the pandemic, and she was so thankful that we gave them permission to do the right things for kids. For instance, to move to a more project and problem-based approach to allow kids more time to show mastery on assignments, removing due dates, um, grading for mastery and competency versus um, requiring kids uh, to turn in assignments for, you know, and using those to, 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 to assess them. Um, giving kids an opportunity to earn credit um, for passion-driven learning. Um, one of the things that I think the federal government could do and school district superintendents can do this, state superintendents can do this, is almost create a safety zone that empowers, that encourages people to try approaches that are learner-centered, that have been proven to produce learning in, in, in students and almost remove this, um, this rat race that we've been on there for such a long time to really produce outcomes without considering the inputs um, exceptionally well. So I think, I think that, is, that is one thing. Along those same lines as Dr. Uh, Gilmore is really thinking about assessments. So there are ways to assess students that are much more healthy, that are much more well-rounded than the ways we are currently. So how do we promote um, differentiating assessments, portfolio-based assessments, assessments that require students to produce knowledge and content um, as opposed to some of the road assessments that they've been um, held accountable um, to exclusively. Um, so not necessarily doing away, but just exclusively like including other types of assessments to, to truly assess students on some of the larger competencies that we really value you know, in, in our system. I think those are a couple of ways that'll give people some freedom to, to try some other approaches that we know work for kids. Yeah, I want to come back to this discussion. I think it's really an important one about this means to an end, but I want to begin to get Michael's voice into the room um, as well. I, I think, frankly, we've established the fact that technology is a tool. Uh, it is not the end, but a means to an end. I think really well said, too, that the purpose is thinking about one an enhanced definition of success, not just are you proficient, uh, are you graduated high school, but frankly, it's a lifelong success kind of orientation that many of us are thinking about career pathways, especially one that aligned to today's workforce, you know, a digital promise uh, with, uh, thanks to the National Science Foundation, we talk quite a bit about computational thinking, which we know really benefits every subject area and leads on these ideas around leveraging technology. Um, so assuming that we understand, and we'll come back to talking about the, the sort of the means to this end or what the goal is, Let's come back to the means for a second. Uh, access to technology, we know, is critical. We've got gaps in many parts of our country. And the amazing amount of funding that came from the feds, I think it will go a long way in solving for the, for the issue. But by no means is it going to be uh, uh, the end of the problem. Uh, this is a longer term problem. This is why I want to bring Michael's voice into this piece here. So, Michael, a year ago, New America published a paper um, on the remote learning crisis report, reporting that at the outset of the pandemic, at least 16 million K-12 students and 3.4 or 3 to 4 million post-secondary students lacked access to a working device, reliable high-speed internet or both. 
we narrowed that to um, to about 12 million as of December 2020, uh, and it got even even smaller because of the funding from the from the feds. Um, so we've made great progress, but we have a long way to go. Will you please help us outline what gaps remain, how we may address some of these issues, and frankly, how do we want and fall close the digital gap? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jean Claude, for including me. I'm uh, not the educator, but the broadband policy guy in the group. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, our our, our report really um, focused quite a bit on how the remote learning crisis, you know, that arose that you know in the pandemic arose from a pre-existing homework gap. So the good news is most students are finally getting connected. Uh, the bad is this is temporary and we are going to be back uh, where we started. Uh, and as Dr. Fisher said, you know, that's not, that's not a good place um, when we think about the jobs uh, and opportunity of the future. So just to uh, kind of set the, maybe kind of bring everyone up on the, on this, you know, on where we're at. So as Jean-Claude said, at, at the outset of the pandemic, there were roughly 16 million K-12 students um, who were not online at home, uh, didn't have adequate internet access for remote learning. And that reflects the reality that more than one in five U.S. households lacked uh, broadband internet. One year later, the end of the last school year, um, that had been improved to about nine to 12 million. Um, this digital learning gap also reflects a tremendous income in, and tremendous income in racial disparities. So Common Sense Media did a survey uh, early last summer that showed that low income black and Hispanic students were nearly half as likely to be able to engage in remote learning during the shutdowns as their you know, white or more affluent counterparts. Um, we filed back in April of 2020, we immediately filed the, an emergency petition at the Federal Communications Commission asking for a expansion of E-rate, the Universal Service Fund program for schools uh, to be spent for connections, you know, to allow, uh, put more money forward and allow it to be used uh, for connections off school property for students and teachers at home. Uh, and the FCC denied that. They did not want to set a precedent to allow E-rate funds to be used uh, for uh, off school property. Um, thankfully though, uh, last March, um, the American Rescue Plan included $7 billion for an emergency connectivity fund for schools and libraries. And those funds began flowing uh, last fall. As of yesterday, and this was an update from the FCC, um, nearly 10,000 schools and 800 libraries have received $4.2 billion. 4.7 million uh, additional students have received broadband service, uh, mostly mobile hotspots, and nearly 9 million devices have been approved. Uh, another 2.4 billion remains to be announced or awarded. Uh, in addition, the pan an another pandemic program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, is subsidizing home broadband for uh, 10 million households, many with children who as a result need only a device to connect. So in sum, <laughs> it's sort of again, finish this, this update. In, in sum, the good news is that nearly all students uh, may be able to access remote learning now or, or soon. The bad news is these programs are temporary. The Emergency Connectivity Fund uh, has only $1 billion left, um, and, and they'll probably open a, third, uh, a second window for that soon. Uh, the current funding ends in June. And even the Build Back Better uh, legislation that the Democrats are still haggling over includes only about 300 million more. So it'll barely take us into next fall. Um, what we need are sustainable ways to permanently close the homework and remote learning gap. 
and there's really some innovative districts um, who have lessons for us, which you know I can speak to further, but I don't want to you know go on too much longer because that's a lot of uh, background data to digest. Michael, maybe Chris, I'll bring you back into this as well, too. I mean, you made reference, Michael, to the homework gap, and I've heard the FCC chairwoman talk quite a bit about the homework gap. Uh, can you describe what, what that is and why um, that is the reference? Uh, and maybe as you're speaking, our superintendents, including DeAndre, can think a little bit about what that meant for you as a practitioner, as someone leading a system. So what do we mean by the homework, homework gap and why is that important? Yeah, so the, the new chairwoman of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, has been talking about this, you know, or agitating about it really for years uh, before the pandemic. And it's, you know, it's the, just the notion that um, uh, roughly 16 million K-12 students were going home after school each day, uh, some to often with a Chromebook and nothing to connect it to. You know, they, they did not have internet access uh, and so they couldn't complete homework. Something like 70% of, of teachers, at least in high, at the high school level, were assigning homework that required internet access. So you, you had, you know, the classic um, example is, and it's literally true, students uh, sitting on the grass or in cars or uh, in the parking lot outside McDonald's or Starbucks, uh, trying to, you know, get the leakage of, of Wi-Fi um, you know, after schools to do their to do their homework at the libraries, which closed too early, um, and so you know they were really falling behind. It also completely defeats any effort to have more of a blended curriculum uh, that incorporates technology, you know, um, comprehensively throughout the learning experience, and and you know, and that's devastating, especially at the the middle and high school levels. Thanks, Michael. Chris, any addition to all this? Ah, uh, the joy of being the, the federal representative <laughs> on, a, on a panel with things like this. So, um, well, first I'm gonna turn back to Michael for one, one thing, uh, which I think might just help the audience. You've been talking about how Jessica uh, Rosenthorsel has been agitating on this point for a while, um, but also uh, has sort of been in lockstep with the Secretary of Ed on the, the use of E-rate. Um, from, from your sense, how do you reconcile those two? And then I will and then I'll add to that how to how I sort of reconcile those two and and what are the things I think sort of need to happen with E-rate. Sure. Um, well, you know, as I said, the um, uh, the you know petition that we filed, as did the state of Colorado and believe it was Nebraska or Iowa um, at the outset of the pandemic, you know, that was a Republican majority on the FCC and they did not want to set a precedent of expanding E-rate. In fact, the chair had opposed back in, during the Obama administration, there was a major expansion of E-rate to include Wi-Fi. So E-rate initially was what we today call category one the goal was to get a fiber, a fiber connection, a very fast gigabit plus fiber connection to every school and library. Um, and then in 2014, uh, the commission proposed, well, hey, if that's not enough. We need internal wiring and Wi-Fi so that every student has that speed at their desk uh, and every teacher in every classroom. And so the and so category two was created and and with a big upfront. Uh, funding, I think $2 billion, um, you know, so that there could be a kind of a crash effort to um, extend Wi-Fi throughout schools and really anywhere on school property. But the law, as it's written, <laughs> it has been interpreted, at least by the prior FCC, to prohibit spending any E-rate funds uh, off school property, even to the degree that these innovative school districts who are um, ex, who are ex, trying to extend the school network to the community using wireless technologies, such as putting you know, to, uh, a, a cell tower on their roof, on the roofs of school buildings or teachers' homes. Um, they cannot use the fiber that goes to the school after school hours, even when it's not in use, which actually doesn't cost anything. They can, but it's cost allocated. 
uh, which is a, an inhibition. Um, so again, uh, a year ago after the inauguration of Biden, you know, my organization, New America, along with um, the Schools Health Library Broadband Coalition and the American Library Association filed another petition um, asking for E-rate to be um, expanded, you know, to allow that flexibility as well as additional funding. Um, and it's still pending, but it was eclipsed by this emergency connectivity fund, which was immediate money, seven, almost 7.2 billion. And it's been a godsend, but as I said, it's temporary, it runs out. So we're hoping that uh, Chair, Chairwoman Rosenworcel continues to support the effort to revisit the scope of E-rate and particularly in tandem with um, contribution rate reform of the Universal Service Fund, which is necessary, um, you know, that we can have, uh, maybe that can be the permanent solution rather than relying on year-to-year -year appropriations from Congress, which as I said, will be, will run out by the next school year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for me, trying to reconcile this issue, I'm gonna separate into two components. One is, do students need access to devices and, um, and internet access at home to be able to do virtual learning, whether or not it's to extend their school day, whether or not it's because of the homework gap, whether or not it's because of school shutdowns? Yes. I think there's an interesting question about whether or not E-rate uh, is the right mechanism for that or not. And the reason I say that is because E-rate is designed uh, as a matter of policy to support the use of technology in school buildings, which I also feel strongly about. And I would argue that there is not enough money in E-rate right now to accomplish that first goal in and of itself. And that there's a lot of further upgrades that need to, be, need to happen in school buildings. Now, if there is a lot more money put into E-rate enough to be able to tackle both issues, sure, you can use E-rate as the mechanism. But when I look and say, actually, I need my home I need home environment for students to be conducive for learning. There are more components than just technology that are necessary to create a good lear learning space at home. So I would love to actually see something beyond E-rate, something that was a bit more comprehensive about turning home environments or outside of school environments into um, very accommodating and inviting learning spaces and recognizing that you need technology, you also need heat, you need light, you need resources, right? It, I, I don't think technology is enough. So when I think about it that way, E-rate isn't necessarily my ideal vehicle, though it could help solve part of that problem. And I think the longer the pandemic goes on, the more out of class or out of school learning environments will be recognized as learning spaces. And the more that that continues to happen, the more something is gonna to have to be put in place that tries to tackle the various uh, shortcomings that actually exist in outside of school learning environments. Um, so, so that's sort of my stance. I wanna sort of push for the big thing. I'm certainly not against expanding E-rate um, to necessarily do that, but I also don't wanna steal money from the school buildings in order to do it. I'd love to see it happen um, in other ways. I'm, I'm, I'm curious how, how folks would respond to that. Chris, before, you, before anyone else responds, Dr. Fisher, I'll let you go first, but there's a note here from S.Y. Mason Watson. Patrick, keep adding your questions to, to the q and I'm monitoring and I'll try to integrate them as much as I can, but we'll leave a dedicated room as we get to your questions. Um, this person says that urban and rural school districts need more broadband and Wi-Fi access. Sending fully equipped mobile buses into these areas have been successful in a variety of districts across the country. How can parents advocate successfully for these type of strategic solutions and of course, how can digital promise, maybe digital, that's, that's you, this is your second full day in the office, um, be of assistance here. So I know uh, all of you, like official to Gilmore, all of you guys have been thinking about this, um, especially this idea of the homework gap, access to technology and learning outside of the walls, the four walls of a school. So Dr. Fisher, I think you are coming off mute if you want to go first. Yeah, I was just going to uh, quickly uh, jump in there, Chris, because a lot of the the challenges of 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 E-rate often, you know, again, is limited to, you know, school facilities. 
you know, but that's a great and opportune, opportune time for districts to re evaluate their current school budgets to reallocate resources and really try to flip the script, a lack of better words, if the kids aren't in the building, you now have a host of resources available to you that would normally be housed in, in the building. So taking those opportunities to, to redeploy resources in other areas can't often allows us to fill that gap. So we were able to do that in the district uh, throughout the, the, the pandemic, uh, throughout the pandemic, just, you know, most of our, our budgeting was always focused on things that were within the building. So when we started to look at it line item by line item, we were able to see their opportunities to say, let's just shift it. We're, we're, we're not, we're going, we're not going to be able to do this particular uh, uh, function. We're not going to be able to do this. So why don't we start to utilize those types of resources with an understanding that our E-rate projects will continue to go on and so forth, but it does free up some dollars uh, during this particular time. So that worked to our advantage. Uh, but over the long term, uh, it would be important to be able to have some a, a little more flexibility in regards to uh, what that interpretation of what E-rate project projects look like and flexibilities on how to deploy those resources out into our school communities. So it doesn't necessarily lock us in because, you know, those, those federal requirements pretty much lock you into a space of so you need to adhere to X, Y, and Z. This is how those dollars need to be spent. So I do think it's an ongoing, uh, if we're going to sustain this, uh, uh, this momentum in, in digital learning, we're going to have to really sit down and reevaluate the, the process. And again, there are some, you know, social economic status plays into the part. You know, there are communities who, who truly, you know, without being said, need more resources than others. So we have to go back to the table and having the different types of conversations regarding uh, what types of flexibility should be based on. And it may have to go back to looking at those socioeconomic status and, and determination with some types of flexibilities of some sort. Yeah, and that's part of why the ARP dollars are more flexible because there is a recognition that learning isn't just happening in the building. The question is the new normal on the other side, where does learning happen? And I think this is a, another place where we'll get to the new normal and then policy may lag what's actually happening. But I think right now everyone's waiting to see what that new normal is and keeps hoping that it's done, right? That we're going back in and then, but then we get Delta, then we get Omicron. So Look, I'm not going to defend all federal policy everywhere, but I am going to say, how do I think the forces actually happen here? And I think there's recognition of it in this moment, and there's not recognition of it for three years from now that it's not everyone back in a building. But the more that that turns out to be the case, I think we may see some policy update. It just may lag. Yeah. You know, I, th I think the new normal is going to be ubiquitous learning. Like, as soon as we embrace this idea, that genuine learning can happen anytime and anywhere. I think we'll start to see a major shift. But while the federal government is working out the kinks and how they'll fund it, uh, thankfully there are nonprofits and for-profit organizations that are working to close this digital divide every single day. So for instance, uh, I support and am on the Verizon Innovative Learning School team. It's a wonderful partnership between Digital Promise and Verizon. Uh, and for the last you know, eight, 10 years or so, have been working to close that digital divide, providing uh, web-enabled devices and high-speed internet access to children, the middle school at the high school level uh, to support creating opportunities for very powerful learning to take place. But aside from providing the devices and the connectivity, what the VILS program does exceptionally well is to provide the type of coaching to building leaders, to district leaders, to teachers that actually makes the utilization of technology the utilization of connectivity to the internet and learning come together in powerful ways. And I think, you know, our CEO always asks the question, to what end, to what end? And I think as we think about, you know, why, the why behind the ubiquitous learning, the why behind device and connectivity is because we are preparing a whole generation of people to function in a very digital economy. And if you think about this, uh, during the height of the pandemic, I had families in my community that I was serving that did not have access to the internet or to devices, and they were not able to do Grubhub or to do uh, those online food delivery services, like very basic you know, technologies and advances that some of us take for granted. There are still real people that can participate um, in, in, in that type of experience right now, let alone the types of experiences that are really gonna make learning engaging and powerful for kids. 
because right now there's just uh, millions of kids that are bored out of their minds in normal school. Um, and so we have to do something differently about that. But I think there are partners at organizations, particularly Verizon Digital Promise, that have been working really hard to address that digital divide. And we've been doing it successfully for you know, eight years or so uh, and across 511 campuses uh, across, across this country. So we're really excited about that. I should, uh, I just wanted to note that, you know, as, as Dr. Fisher uh, said, um, actually, our, you know, our coalition in doing this advocacy, what we've emphasized on E-rate, we've emphasized more than anything is the flexibility uh, because, you know, in doing for our reports and um, a whole lot of profiles we're doing now of innovative districts, you know, we've, we've interviewed CTOs and superintendents and, you know, we keep hearing, you know, that they, they want flexibility because, you know, most schools now have connected, they have fiber connected, they have the internal wiring done. Um, they feel like there's incentives now to gold plate uh, these, these uh, their Wi-Fi, for example, internally because they need, to, they want to spend the money. Um, and they say what they need, you know, what they want is flexibility and maybe down a formula, you know, with limited funds, there may be a, you know, a, lim a limitation, a formula uh, that you, you know, you can't, you can only get so much based on your need, uh, but the flexibility is, is really critical. At the same time, I, you know, <laughs> I would agree with Chris that, that certainly this is a societal problem. And so for example, this uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that just passed, um, extended the emergency broadband benefit that I mentioned with the affordable uh, connectivity program. Um, again, it's only going to last a few years, but if we could get, you know, if every family could get, um, you know, cable, cable broadband or other high-speed broadband uh, without, you know, that being a responsibility of schools or local governments, you know, so much the better. But we don't, you know, we really don't know yet uh, how reliable this pandemic funding will be into the future. Um, so, so I think, you know, um, that's why, you know, we want to push it on, on, on both paths. Michael, thank you. You know, one of the things we did as um, when the League of Innovative Schools visited Washington, D.C. back in the fall, and Chris, uh, thank you for, for coming to speak to the superintendents. I know one thing I heard them push collectively to our elected officials is that, thank you so very much for what you've done, but no, this is not a one-time effort. This has to be continuous. How do we think about that? And made it clear too, it's not just the feds, but how do the feds support the state chiefs? Uh, because some of this policy come from the state, not from the federal government, making sure that they are thinking too about how the continuity support um, work that we see uh, moving forward. Let me pivot a bit to this idea of professional learning. I know Matt, um, and forgive me for your last name, Matt, is it Highfield or Heyfield, uh, put in the chat around professional development. We know we've done a lot in the last two years about sort of really effective, uh, perhaps remote or hybrid professional learning. How have you guys been thinking about that in your schools? And DeAndre, you just left the superintendent, please add as well to I guess I, I could start there. So professional development, um, I think is always a complicated in schools. Right now to give teachers time within the school day is nearly impossible when you know they're dealing with students at school and quarantined and sick and all of the things we're asking them to do. But in our district already about five years ago, we built a, all of our compensation model is around individualized professional development for our staff. And so um, we, we believe, and I believe that our, our staff is everything, so is our support staff to us. And so really investing in, um, in them is one of the most important things we can do. I have to say though, we were just changing to a new LMS about three weeks prior to the pandemic starting and we were gonna do this slow pilot. Um, we, we took on Canvas within three weeks. People went from zero to 100 because they had to. Um, but we also had four um, uh, tech support staff members who really helped build um, pieces for our teachers. 
And so one of the things I somebody had asked in the, the questions is like, how do you do literacy to support with digital? One of the things we learned, and I don't know why we didn't think about this earlier, is we took our reading coaches, our literacy coaches, um, our math coaches, and we had them help create high quality, engaging um, mini lessons, um, materials for staff, so they didn't have to create everything themselves. And, you know, it's kind of our own brand of teachers pay teachers, but it's vetted. <laughs> uh, because the biggest issue I have is when things are not vetted. And I think, you know, we need to have high quality engaging things. And I think we need to support our staff um, because we cannot expect people to teach, you know, eight hours of the day, then prepare for the next day, but then go to a three hour session at night. Um, that's the kind of life I'm leading right now. And I don't know how long I can sustain it, right? Um, so I think that's something we really need to um, prioritize what is most important and what our teachers and staff tell us is most important. Because sometimes I think as administrators, we try to tell them what is most important and that's not always the case. Thank you. Dr. Fisher? Yeah, I have to concur with uh, Dr. Gilmore. You know, professional development, uh, we've created a model where PD is on demand, you know, just to really give a lot of flexibility to our teachers to really, um, you know, obtain a skill set in a lot, a, a number of areas. So it's important that we give them that flexibility because the, the, the traditional school day is so rigid, uh, you know, again, they need a break. It's, 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 it's an overload, you know, it becomes a point where you continue to, you know, uh, use that concept of, of old school practices in a digital space, and it becomes very consuming to the teachers. So uh, it's, it's great to hear from, from the teachers what their needs are. The feedback is essential because we make these decisions as upper heads and never taken the opportunity to put the boot, you know, have the boots on the ground in the conversation. So that is, is critical without reintroducing too many new things. You know, one of the things I've, I've pledged to the leadership is that Let's not try to, you know, introduce too much at this particular time. Let's slow down. Let's, let's, let's be very intentional with the things that are a priority because we too introduced a new learning management system. We've uh, utilized Schoology, which was all new for our teachers who were, you know, navigating their way through that. But as, I, as, as, as teachers normally do, they treat it like a social media platform. They figure it out. They find ways to make it more inviting, more engaging uh, for the students and their families. So uh, that has been a plus. And that was that year one. That year two, you're now seeing that they're, they're able to, to use the, the digital resources. So along those lines, one of the things we wanted to do is ensure that it wasn't just a free willy type of uh, digital resource uh, opportunity for teachers. Let's keep it in a space where it's more manageable. We want to know who owns the data at the end of the day. You know, let's not just keep signing up for anything. Let's, let's ensure that there are standards-based resources that we're using. So those are the things that we really had to focus on and just to kind of narrow it in. But that professional development piece on demand has been uh, a great opportunity to reach out teachers uh, because, we, you know, we all need it. And, and, and Christine, I will tell you the same. You know, my day starts early and it ends late, you know, and I'm not sure how I'm doing it. But from a leadership space, it's important that we we stay abreast of all these changing. I think that Fisher froze. Um, but, you know, he, he was mentioning something um, that has been foot of mind for me for the last uh, uh, year uh, and a half. Process, Sorry. exactly. Good. Sorry, Dr. Fisher, you froze for a second. Um, just this idea of learning management system. So we all think about technology enabling sort of classroom instruction, but to your point, Dr. Fisher, you know, technology has also enabled this idea of connected curricula, right? So everything from standards to, to assessment, to pedagogy, to curriculum, and, and student data, effectively, right? Uh, staff data. So this, these LMSs, now seem to be ubiquitous across across the, across the country. So, uh, Dre, a little bit about what you're seeing from that yeah. as well. Too. Go ahead. Absolutely, just the same sentiments for teachers as I have for students has to be personalized. It absolutely needs to be competency based, and they need to have their own learning paths. Sometimes we don't think of teachers as needing their own learning paths to uh, to kind of grow professionally. Um, and some of the work that we started to do uh, in DeSoto was, you know, thinking about, you know, what are all the qualities, characteristics uh, that really define our teachers at various years? 
And what are those core competencies, those really core skill sets, and then the really core dispositions and mindsets that we want teachers to have. What we found is that teachers had to do a lot of unlearning because there were so many um, practices, beliefs uh, that they experienced as children, that they experienced in their teacher prep programs that just aren't uh, applicable uh, to the needs of kids in classrooms in 2022. Uh, and so identifying those mindsets and having to do that deep internal work uh, to really define what is equity and access, you know, what is engaging curricular and what are true learning experiences that really empower kids. You know, let's talk about grading and let's unlearn what we've learned about grading and let's, you know, learn uh, what true um, uh, assessment for learning really is basics around formative and summative assessments. To this day, there's still a need to truly understand the power of how to use formative assessments to drive student learning. Uh, and there's a number of technologies that help teachers uh, formatively assess students very quickly, use those data to do something with it, as opposed to spending time trying to analyze data. There's so many platforms that do it for uh, teachers so they can use that data to, to move the needle for kids. I think those are the types of experiences that teachers are really looking for. And then finally, moving along the micro credentialing route, um, I'm seeing a lot of organizations start to think about professional learning in terms of micro credentialing, both for students, but really for staff though. And I know Digital Promise does some, this is a shameless plug, but we actually do a, a wonderful job with creating content curricula and micro credentialing educators, some of the best that I've seen. Um, and I think, I think districts that are really looking forward to uh, improving professional learning for, for their teachers will start to look at you know, micro credentialing and those learning pathways that lead to um, uh, badges that have been vetted by other experts. Another shameless plug, uh, Dre, uh, Jennifer Kane in the chat has been talking about what well, she talked about this. So and she's not one of our people. So I really appreciate the fact that, yes, MCs can be a really great way of supporting teacher, teacher PD. I want to make sure I get to this topic because, again, this is this is the campaign for grade level reading. Uh, I want to make sure I, I get to, to this particular question around early learning. Um, so pre-K three uh, examples of innovation, uh, things you've seen that really has been leveraged maybe this past two years, um, technology, pandemic. So what have you seen around the early learning, the early learning space? What are you doing in your district? <laughs> well, one of the things for me was I was wondering what did K-1-2 look like when we were fully virtual? Um, and so the way I did it is I read in every one of our K-1 and um, virtual classes. So I was able to meet their classroom space. And it was really interesting because it was, it was way var more varied than I expected. Um, and it gave me a different uh, understanding of what teachers, you know, you had one mom who kept putting her head into the, the classroom, and then you have somebody who's half dressed. And um, I, I, I found that, you know, it was teachers who really cared about their kids, who I think all teachers do, but some at a, a different level, found ways, even when they weren't um, overly tech savvy, um, they created ways for their students to check in, to share information. Um, we had um, an elementary a teacher who actually read a, a nighttime story every single night we were virtual to her students. They could join in their pajamas and her dog. Um, people across the district joined into that. So it, it was one of these things where um, I, I think K-1-2, unless somebody at home can help with a child, I think it is really difficult. And to think that it takes the place, it's one of the reasons we put our resources to bring our earliest learners back to school as soon as possible and kept our older kids in more of a hybrid situation. Um, to me, it's unless there's a parent or a, a sibling that can help, I just don't think it takes the place of the classroom. I just, th I think it's really complicated. Maybe others found differently, but for us, our families felt it was really complicated and it was too long for kids to check in. We did a lot of, you know, for an hour or two, then play, then come back. We sent kits 
um, somebody asked, how do you do project-based learning? We built lots of little kits and dropped them off as our, our food buses went around. So um, I just think we had to be innovative. I agree with you, Dr. Gilmore. And you know, I'll give just two examples very quickly. One, the height of the pandemic, there's an organization called uh, Springboard. I'm not endorsing Springboard at all, but uh, they partnered with Teach for America. And there were these corpse members that would, if you signed up, then they would give you and your child um, these one-on-one -on -one sessions to help students with decoding, with uh, language comprehension, with vocabulary, with phonemic awareness, et cetera. And they would do it. They would send books to the house and then they would work with students in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation via Zoom. Uh, and there were some kinks in the system, but it got me thinking, how do we give the most personalized attention to our earliest learners for the most amount of time um, uh, when they needed the most. At the school district, we decided to use some of our um, ESSER funds to actually restructure our district. Um, we moved from having an isolated pre-K center and elementary uh, campuses from K through five. We, we created two pre-K through second grade campuses. We um, uh, created roles that were literacy and kind of mathematic based coach uh, roles. Um, and then we dramatically reduced the class size. And I'm not a big class size uh, proponent here. Sorry, teachers. Um, but we dramatically reduced the class size to an eight to one situation so that that um, we'll have more master teachers, more teachers uh, to be to have more time on task with our earliest learners. We created additional um, assistant positions in pre-K and kindergarten and made sure they were trained in literacy and math to deliver more effective small group learning for kids, utilizing technology, uh, utilizing um, our in instructional approach based on the science of reading. Um, now, the staffing shortages put a big um, issue uh, with that, um, but the plan was solid. Here, my point is, at the earliest levels, I think the more personalized experience it can, it can be for kids, the more you can utilize technology that can give kids more practice uh, with some of those basic phonemic awareness skills, the decoding skills, um, the more they're going to build their capacity and, and be on grade level for, for, for literacy. Yeah, DeAndre, I, you know, I, I, I'm right there with you. We, um, uh, here in Roselle, you know, I used to be a former principal of a kindergarten academy. So one of the takeaways for me was it was a priority age group. So I knew, you know, that the the, the amount of work that teachers put in to to teach daily, you know, with those, those five and six-year-olds was an enormous lift. So I knew when they shift to a digital space that it would be a, a a far reach in terms of the hands-on and the levels of, of engagement that uh, teachers do at, at our elementary and our, our pre-K and K level. So I, I understood that from the door. One of the things I attempt to do is, is, is particularly visit those classrooms during our learning management, via our learning management system, because I understand the, the challenges of, of the teachers at that level. And of course, you know, a lot of that stuff is, you know, um, hands on, that's rip some paper, that's touch some manipulatives, those types of things while our early learners, because they didn't necessarily have the computer skill set to navigate through the technology. So that was a challenge on the early, you know, in, our, in, the, in the early part of the uh, 2020. So but as we progress, one of the things I've seen that was a contrast was that our students who started this school year out in person, kindergarten teachers were so savvy enough to prepare kids with those devices early on. So when we had to shift to remote learning, the anxiety levels actually were reduced somewhat because they have started to find adaptable skill sets. And it is a heavy lift. And the, the early childhood level is a, is a grade, man, that is a, a priority. You know, we talk about building a foundation for our learners because they feed right into all our upper grade programs. So it is a, it, it, it was it was it was amazing to see the work that they put in. And um I, I, I recall those conversations, you know, how do we do it? How do we do it? And, I, and they found a way and, you know, and teachers are very, uh, they, they can adapt at that level. So I think that is, we have to continually be mindful that, uh, you know, what works with the upper grades doesn't necessarily work with our youngest, our younger learners. So we, you know, it's, that's why we talk about the one size fit all is not a, is not the model. You know, we have to, you know, it's, it's more personalized learning at the, in the earlier grades. So, uh, I, I just felt that that was a need that we needed to support our teachers. And I, I could tell you, um, 
the first year one was a was a heavy lift. It was a heavy lift, and uh, I praised them for that because I, I understood the work. But like uh, Christine said, you know, taking opportunities to read the classes, ensuring that I popped in and and, and got in, you know, got into those conversations. Kids wanted to know who made the decisions for us to stay home, and I would be the guy who says that's him right there. You know, so those types of things were important because. Kids need to be, they need personalized experiences. So I was glad to be, you know, uh, uh, as I continually do this to this day is to, to make my presence known because we can't, you know, the teachers can't do it alone. They need to know that they have the support from the leadership. And that's what's important uh, through these conversations. Thank you. Michael, you wanna go? Go ahead, last, last word. Yeah, I, I hope I'm not shifting off early learning, but I, I did wanna mention an innovative district that um, digital promise profiled at the very outset of the pandemic and the Chris's office profiled in an excellent report last June, and that is um, uh, Lindsay, California, um, a farm worker community in the Central Valley in California. It's about 4,300 students, 75% below the poverty line, many, many um, multi-family households. Uh, majority ESL when they come to school, uh, and they didn't miss a beat when the shutdowns occurred. They just kept right on going uh, because what they had done is they had uh, built out a Wi-Fi network uh, starting from the roofs of their school buildings, the roofs of their teachers' homes to connect all the students, uh, and they currently have uh, you know seventy-five percent of their students relying on that network, which during the pandemic, thanks to you know, some additional funding, pandemic funding, they've now kind of upgraded that network so that it's mostly Wi-Fi, but they use other free access to the public airwaves, educational spectrum, citizens broadband spectrum, uh, you know, to, to, reach, to reach the homes that are a little further out from the central uh, core. And what, what's really fascinating, I think, is that they, they, did, they were motivated initially, not because they anticipated a pandemic, uh, but to implement a blended learning curriculum, which they say they can document has had um, a big academic, uh, measurable academic success in terms of uh, high school retention, graduation, going on to college, test scores, just in a few years. Um, and it's, uh, and, 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 and all the, the kind of the maintenance the, the OPEX, the maintenance and replacements uh, of that is, is covered by going all digital. They don't use textbooks, no paper. It's like a, it's like a modern workplace, actually, <laughs> where, you know, where the students submit their work uh, you know, electronically and they always have access to the school network and resources. So, and there's other, you know, Council Bluffs, Iowa has done the same, is in the process of doing the same thing. Uh, Eastside Union, San Jose, predominantly, you know, Hispanic, uh, Latino, um, is, is doing this um, with their high schools, uh, nine high schools. They've done three at, for $3 million. Um, and this is uh, an example of a sustainable solution to permanently close the homework gap. Uh, and, you know, and I'm not sure this, this, the source of funds, these have been lucky, whether it's a bond issue in San Jose or the fact that Google had its biggest... Um, server and council bluffs and so they contributed along with a local foundation uh, but if you can get that capex uh, you know the opex is is sustainable and you're not buying subscriptions for kids every month forever a cool amazing way to close talk about the sustainability of all of, all of this uh, I'm, I'm out of time uh, Sierra, thanks for putting the uh, uh, poll uh, the uh, the survey on on, on the screen. Uh, and, and Becky, before I turn it over to you very quickly, really want to thank all of you uh, from policy to amazing practitioners. Uh, you guys have circled the wagon. Thank you so much for, for being here, for being a part of this conversation. Becky? Yes, just uh, echoing um, your comments. And um, I know Ralph put a, a quick note in the chat. Many thanks to our panelists, our great, great panelists today. This was such an extraordinary webinar. And to um, all of um, our participants who um, elected to spend an hour and a half with us today. Um, the, the time was well spent as I'm sure you already know. So thank you so much. The recording and all the resources and the many resources that were posted throughout the um, webinar today will be, um, will be sent out to you uh, later this week. And please be sure to 
register for our upcoming webinars as well. So thanks to all of you. And um, we hope to see you um, soon, um, as soon as next week. So thanks everyone. Stay warm, stay safe, and um, we'll see you soon. Take good care. Thank you.